Welcome to this tailoring lecture. Today I'll be showing you how to make a cross jet and flat pocket. To begin with, we're going to go over trims. So starting off, we've got a piece of linen holland, which will be used to back the pocket and stiffen it. Then we have our lining, which will go behind our flap. Some fusible, which we'll use to strengthen the jet as well as the flap. Some silesia for the pocket bag and some cloth. To begin with, we're going to grab our cloth. So the first step is to ensure that you've marked with arrows the direction of your grain, like so. I've got two layers of fabric here, one over the other, so I mark it on both sides of the wrong sides of my fabric. I grab one piece and fold away the other. ensuring that I've got the right side going in the right direction. So to begin with, we're going to mark off our pocket placement. Grab a rule and a sharp bit of chalk. And I begin placing where it is I'd like my pocket to be. I then chalk a line for the start of my pocket. And I chalk a line for the end of my pocket, which today will be five and a half inches long. I'm now going to mark my pocket placement in. You don't strictly have to do this, but in this case I'm working on a tweed that loses chalk quite easily. So to ensure that I don't lose my marks, I'm just going to quickly thread mark it in. So now I'm going to begin to draw my flap shape. I draw a perpendicular line going down from my pocket mouth, at the front of the pocket, and at the rear. Now, the width of your pocket is an aesthetic choice. In this instance, I'm making it two and a quarter inches wide. So I mark two and a quarter inches either side of those perpendicular lines that I've drawn. And I'm going to kick out the flap at the back by three eighths of an inch. Again, this is an aesthetic decision, one that you don't need to follow. Traditionally speaking, a flap does kick out at the back. So now I grab my other piece of fabric and I lay it on top of my first piece by matching in the checks, ensuring that the right side of the cloth is facing towards me. So the process of matching needs to be done carefully. As you can see, I'm flipping the fabric up and down. This allows me to verify that the intersections of the checks are well and truly on top of one another. Be careful to take your time here and ensure that it matches across the entire section of the flap. Checks can warp. Once you're happy, bang the chalk marks to the wrong side of the piece that you will be using to make your flap in. So you can see those faint marks that have been transferred across. And I now just join up those lines to mark exactly where my flap needs to be so that my checks are matching. I then cut about three quarters of an inch or an inch all the way around the sides and the bottom of my flap. And at the top, I'm going to leave just a few inches. Now grab your fusible and make sure that you are using the correct grade. So I can tell the grain of my fusible by 
where the salvage is. I cut out a piece that is just wide enough to cover my flap. I trace an initial line and a perpendicular one to that and chop those out. I now lay my fusible onto my flap and I make sure that the fusible is sitting just within the chalk marks that I've made. So I'm marking it across on the outer edge of the flap, tracing it, and cutting it out. Now it's important that your fusible is sitting just within those lines because we don't want to stitch it down and thicken the edges of our flap. We want this fusible to be kept in place by the prick stitch that finishes off the flap right at the end. Now you can press your fusible in place. Make sure that you leave your iron on for a sufficient amount of time for the glue to melt. And once it's dried off, I'm going to thread mark the shape of this flap in. Now I'm only doing this because the chalk marks are particularly faint on this tweed. So to ensure that I don't lose them, and that I have nice clean crisp lines to sew on, I'm going to go overboard here and thread mark everything in. Now again, remember we are stitching to the outside of our fusible. We don't want to catch the fusible within the stitch. Grab your lining, make sure that you have your arrows in place. Grab your flap and lay it on the slight bias with the right side of your flap up facing you and the wrong side of the lining facing you and cut out a panel that is just big enough to cover your flap piece. Now notice that I've cut the lining out on the slight bias, not on a full bias, on a slight bias. And I'll explain this in a second. So lay your flap down and begin by stitching it in place with a baste at the top. Once you've done that, you're going to trim the lining to the same length as the cloth for the flap. You're then going to tug the lining down by a good eighth of an inch, making it ever so slightly tight against the cloth that sits on top. And now proceed to baste everything down with a running or a pad stitch. Once you reach your first corner, you're going to do exactly the same thing but this time with the width of the flap. You're also going to maintain that loss of an eighth all the way down the bottom of the flap. Notice how the green lining is coming down from the cloth by an eighth of an inch all the way down the bottom edge. So here I am tugging the outer edge of the flap by that small eighth, you can see the gather of cloth that sits on top. Give that a good pull. And the bottom of the lining is kept tight all along its width as I stitch it along. It's 
So we have a loss of an eighth across the length and across the width. And it's important that you maintain this cloth, this loss, sorry, all across that piece. Notice how now I push the cloth of the flap inwards to maintain the loss of an eighth along the width of the flap. And then tack off. With that in place, you can press everything in to make things easier to sew. And now you can proceed with machine stitching your thread marked edge. I've now stitched everything in place and I trim my excess thread. You can remove your baste. And now proceed to iron the edges of your flap. Lay your flap flat on your board and pull back the cloth edge, maintaining the lining flat against the board. Make sure that you're adding sufficient pressure in order to create a long lasting crease. And continue to fold back the edges across the bottom and across the outer edge. Take your time in the corners and make sure that they are pulled back as far as they can be. And now the last edge. Again, making sure that the corners are nice and flat. Once that's done, do exactly the same thing on the other side, but make sure that your folds are going the other way. So start from the other edge and fold your lining back as far as it will go against the seam. Folding from the other direction will mean that things don't layer quite so much and it will allow you to get a firmer crease into your lining. Again, take the time to press things out properly. Last edge now. And there we have it. So now I'm going to trim the excess seam allowance down to a quarter of an inch all the way around. And make sure that your trims are regular and neat. We left the excess so it was easier to manipulate with the iron. And now we trim them down to the desired widths. Once that's done, you can begin to trim your corners. So lay the blade of your shears in the lip that's formed 
by the folds that you've made and snip right into the corner. Make sure that you don't trim so far that your corner is going to blow out, but trim far enough so that there are no excesses left. And your aim here is to create a little bit of a triangle so that the little seam allowances that are left wrap over just so that they butt together, but that there are no excesses in that corner left to create any bulk. Sometimes you don't lay your blade in quite so far enough, so it's good to go back in and just trim those tiny little yarns off to make sure that the whole thing will be laying flat once you bag it out. And there you have it. Now it's time to turn your flap out. Be delicate with your points. You don't want these to blow out. So start by just getting them inverted and ensure that while you do invert them, all the iron work that you've done to ensure that the seam allowances lay neatly together is maintained. With that done, you can now continue pulling out the points with a needle. Please do so delicately as it's easy at this point because there is so little left of seam allowance within those points to fray them out. If you've done your job correctly, they should be rather easy to pull. The key to a successful point is to get it sharp and to get it flat. You don't want any bulk in there. The danger, obviously, again, is to pull too hard or too far and to fray out the edges. With that done, I'm going to now curl the seam as far as it can go out and I'm going to pull it back ever so slightly so that the lining is sitting within the width of the flap. I do this by leaving about a sixteenth of an inch of cloth visible from the side from which I'm working. And I do this in a small, tight running stitch all the way down. So notice how there's a tiny little lip of cloth visible from the side from which I'm working and that the lining is kept back by that small sixteenth. Now this explains why we made the lining shorter than the cloth that sat on top. Had we not, there would have been an excess of lining left on the underside of the flap and it would have caused rippling and been unsightly. The second reason why we make the lining ever so slightly tight is so that the flap can curl round to form the same shape that the jacket will be once it's worn by the wearer. We don't want the flap to extend out. We want it to be kept in nice and tight. This also explains why we use the lining on the slight bias, because we want it to stretch ever so slightly, but not to be completely yielding. Take your time here and make sure that you're creating a very even run at the bottom of your flap. Once you've finished that and gone all the way around, tack off. So you can now begin to press your flap, pull back the lining, make sure that it's sitting well within the width of the flap, and even out the edges as best you can. Now 
Now, grab your flap and mark the top of it. And this is two and a quarter inches from the bottom on either side and chalk a line across. Place it on the pocket mouth opening and make sure that you've done your job right and that your checks match. Once you've done this, grab your fusible. Again, you want to make sure that the strength that you need is going in the right direction. So in this case, the direction that you see me chalking on is the warp. And I want that warp to go across the opening of my pocket so that I've got the strongest fibers keeping my pocket mouth from stretching open. Begin by tracing two lines that are about two inches apart and round off one corner. The addition of fusible is not strictly necessary, but given that I'm now dealing with a tweed which frays out rather easily and I'm wanting to make thin jets, I don't want the seam allowances of those jets to become too scant or for my mitres to be too fragile and difficult to manipulate. Once that corner is rounded off, we round off the second corner to make sure that it sits outside of the extremities of our pocket length by about an inch. So this is the wrong side of my cloth. And I'm laying my fusible in, making sure that it sits outside of those extremity points by about one inch. I then fuse it in place. Now grab your linen holland, lay it atop your marked pocket mouth, and cut a piece out of it, which is two inches wide and an inch longer either side of your pocket mouth opening. Lay this beneath your pocket mouth opening, center it, and baste it down in place. Tack off, and remove your former stitch. Here I'm remarking the ends of my pocket, just so I don't lose my chalk marks. And what we're going to do is lay a piece of cloth which is cross grain to the one that we're putting the pocket in. The reason we do this is because the warp is stronger than the weft and we want the jets of our pockets not to stretch out. So lay a piece in which is about five inches wide and again about an inch wider in the extremities either side of our pocket. And what I'm doing here is I'm deciding where I'm going to match the jet across. I'm having a look, twisting it round, seeing which check I'd like to match. And I think I'm going to match the first one on the left, which is likely to be the most visible.
and now begin basting it down into place from one end of your pocket mouth to the other. Again, here I'm making sure that the stripes that form my check are running parallel to the pocket mouth opening. I've also picked a judicious placement for these jets to prevent any more prominent check from being visible once I curl them back. Back tack. And cut off. I'm now satisfied that my checks are matching going down the jet and double checking their placement. It's always best to have another look rather than to go straight to sewing it in place. And I now lay my flap onto my jet fabric, line it up with the checks, and pinning this out of place to make sure that I can see that bottom check matching across. Again, using that flipping technique to make sure everything is in place and matching just how I want it. And I'm now going to match the finalized position of the opening of my pocket mouth. It's important that you do this with the flap, as the flap itself can vary ever so slightly in length when it's sewn. So you're making one final check to make sure that everything is going to match. Now head over to the machine and sew two lines which sit a small quarter of an inch either side of that central base, meaning that the lines themselves should sit anywhere between three eighths and a half inch apart from one another. When sewing these lines in, it's recommended to back tack twice on their extremities to secure them down firmly. Trim your threads. And now you can remove the base that held everything in place before you machined. We're now going to grab some fray check, which is a fabric glue, and we're going to add a couple of dots on either extremity of your two stitch lines. Now we want these dots to sit slightly inside of the stitch points, because what this is going to allow us to do is prevent our mitres from fraying out. Once the glue is dried, leave for about 10 minutes. We're then going to snip down the centre of those stitch, two stitch lines, cutting only the fabric for your jets. So I repeat this, you're only cutting the top fabric, the one that will make up your jets, and you're snipping it down the centre 
all the way across of those two stitch lines. Now, as I go along, I continually press my pieces of cloth to make sure that everything's sitting nicely in place. I'm now going to fold back that centre line of the pocket mouth over itself so I can snip through the middle of it. And now I'm going to cut through all the layers up till three eighths from the ends of my two stitch lines. So again, cutting all the way down the middle of those two stitch lines up to a point which is three eighths within those two stitch lines. So here I'm just refining up to a point three eighths within the stitch lines there. With that done, I'm going to pull the piece of jetting back from one of the corners of my stitch line and I cut a mitre into it either side. So again, pulling the top cloth back, which I don't want to touch, and snipping all the beneath layers into that final stitch point to create that mitre. So you can see that there, there's two little triangles called mitres. Once that's done, I can start to press my jets open. I flip one of them inside, turn my piece of cloth over, Delicately bring the entire bit of cloth out. You need to be very careful with the ends of your stitch lines here. Remember, they're cut all the way to their extremity, so they're going to be very fragile. You don't want them to start fraying out. So just pry them ever so lightly. Fold a lip back of about a quarter of an inch and continue that fold by pressing open your fabric seam on your jet. So you want to open the seam that is fabric to fabric, not fabric to linen holland. Delicately pry open the mitre and finish pressing. Once you've done a press on one side, press it on the other. and repeat the process for the other one. This time you're going to flip your first jet back through, get it to lay flat, and then bring the other unpressed one back in. And now repeat the exact same process of pressing. Again, delicately, prying the jet through without fraying out your mitre any further. The fusible that we put in place and the fray check will hopefully prevent any incidents. But it's important to be careful when manipulating these areas. So again, folding back that initial lip on the jet by a quarter of an inch and pressing open the fabric seam of the jet. And preparing the end for that lip as it comes to the other side.
press on the right side. And then bring that jet inside. Fit your piece of cloth to the right side and now begin rolling your jet, making it exactly half the width of your pocket mouth opening. So roll the beginning of the jet back to prep it as you come into the pocket mouth. Grab a needle that has been threaded on the single and knotted and begin by coming up within the seam of the jet and you're going to prick stitch the jet as you go along rolling it to exactly half of the width of the pocket mouth and securing it in place with that delicate prick stitch which is being stitched within the seam that the jet has been sewn to. As you're going along, make sure that you're maintaining the same width you want your jets to look regular. Now, prepare the other end of your jet by flipping it back. And as you come into the end, you're going to back tack on the wrong side and secure all of that work in place. So once you've safely tacked off and cut your thread, you can begin doing exactly the same thing on the other jet. With both jets now rolled, you can press everything in place. Make sure that the ends of your jets are rolled back correctly. and give everything a good bake. Once that's done, we're going to prepare our mitres. So pull your mitres out by laying the pocket like I have. 
and tug on those tiny little triangles to make sure that they are fully removed from the pocket mouth. Lay them flat against the extremities of the rolled jets and carefully backstitch them in place with a single thread. Make sure you tug your jets and ensure that everything is pulled out nice and neatly. You're going to want these stitches to be close together. Don't pull too tight on them, or you might pull your two jets together and overlap them. You also want these back stitches to form a straight line connecting neatly both extremities of your machine stitches. Once you've finished your stitches, back tack and cut your thread. Now it's important to check your work and make sure that you're happy with the results. If you're not, go back and correct them. And repeat the same thing on the other mitre. Once that's done, you'll want to place your flap in your pocket, lay its top against the open mouth of the jet. And you don't have to do this if you're not trying to match, but if you're trying to match the checks on your flap, it helps to secure the flap down at the base where those checks are most prominent before securing it along its top. The combination of these various layers can lead to a little loss of length in your jets and thus pulling them ever so slightly under the iron can help return them to their initial measure. Equal length of your flap and jet is paramount. If your flap is too long, it will pucker along the top where it meets the jet. If your flap is too short, there will be gaping holes either side of the extremities of your pocket mouth. If you're satisfied with the results, baste the top of the flap in an eighth of an inch above the first jet. It's important to secure this properly, as you don't want this to shift, and to alter all the check matching work that we've done up until now. With that complete, grab your silicia, make sure that you have your arrows in there for the wrong side and for the grain and direction. 
grab a piece that's long enough to make up for your pocket bag. In order to make sure that the piece is long enough, you're going to want to lay the top of the pocket into the top of your solution length. And then fold that solution length back up so that it meets by a seam the bottom of the cloth that makes up your bottom jet. Roll everything back down and place your hand in to see how deep the pocket needs to go. If you have sufficient room for your hand, then your bag is going to be long enough. There are measures for these kinds of things, but they're difficult to recall, and so sometimes judging by eye can be a more efficient and effective way of getting things done without having, if you're not going to repeat these things on and on, to recall those specific measures. So here I'm trimming the facing for the pocket pack. This is a piece of cloth that will go into the top of the bag so that when you place your hand in your pocket, you can't see the color of the silicia, but all you see is the cloth itself. So as you can see, I've got my arrow here and I'm gonna place this piece of facing the same width that I've cut it to down from the top of that bag. It's about three inches wide and it's an inch longer either side of the extremity of the pocket mouth. I'm now going to machine a top line across that facing and then snip my threads. And press all of that nice and flat. With that done, I'm going to begin staggering, that is to say layering in different areas, all of the elements that sit behind the pocket. You want things to stagger so that they don't create bulk and end in the same spots. Once I'm satisfied with the position of the stagger, which I will refine later down the line, I pin in place the top of my linen holland. Now fold your pocket bag back so that it meets with the bottom of your lower jet by a seam. When I say a seam, I mean three eighths of an inch, generally speaking. Pin that into place. And then sew two lines, one connecting the bottom of the bag and one connecting the top of the bag. Make sure that the one connecting the top of the bag is as close as you can get it to the top jet and the one connecting the bottom of the bag, as I said, a seam away from the raw edges that you've pinned in place. That's now sewn. So this stitch has not only secured the top of your bag in place and the bottom of your bag in place, but also your flap. Flip your cloth back up, pull your pocket bag as low as you can, and press this seam downwards.
Now we're going to place a pleat in the bag, which acts as a bit of suspension so that your hand, when it's going into the bag, doesn't pull the jet down. We make it about three quarters of an inch on the double. And we want the crease of the pleat on the outside of the bag to be facing upwards so that when your hand goes into it, it's not caught inside. You also want the crease not to overlap with the seam that you've just made. So have it butt just up against it to avoid any bulk from being created. Once you've secured that in place, you're going to need to pin it down. Your aim here is to pin it directly down from the stitch lines that you will be making for the sides of your pocket bags. And these will sit almost down perpendicular from the pocket mouth opening either side of the mitre. Now that that's secured in place, you can press a crease at the bottom of your bag. This helps to fix things in place when you're machining. The aim now is for you to trace the shape of the pocket bag. You want it to fit your hand. Judge how deep you want it based on the size of your hand. The first line at the front of your pocket mouth will sit perpendicular from the opening. And the second line at the back of the bag will follow the kick out of the flap. This is to account for the natural splay of your small finger. Now grab something that has a small circle to it and use that to round the ends of your pocket bag. This prevents any lint from accumulating inside your bag and trace its bottom. Now you're gonna machine down the bag from the mitre, along the line that you just traced and back up. That's now sewn, and you can now see that stitch line all the way around. Trim your threads. And press everything down. Now you can begin trimming a 3 8 or half inch seam allowance all the way around the pocket bag.
You can now remove your base. You can now proceed to refine the stagger of all of the elements that sit at the top of your bag. As you can see, I'm layering things in about a quarter inch increments so that nothing ends in the same spot. Last thing to do is to baste your flap down. A couple of pads on either edge and a couple of reverse stitches across the bottom. Once you've given everything one last deep press, you would just have to add two D-tacks either side of your mitres and edge stitch your pocket flap. And that would be the job complete. Best of luck for yours.